for this Advent season, we've been going through the uh, section of Luke chapter 2 where the uh, angels appeared to the shepherds and have been looking at what this, uh, what, what we can learn from various questions of Christmas and how we, uh, how we learn from those shepherds. And um, as, as we do this, we're once again returning to Luke chapter 2, beginning with verse 8. And I would invite you as we, um, as we open God's Word together, as you're able, to stand. Um, and we'll be reading Luke 2, verses 8 through 20. as our children began for us earlier. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word considering, concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. May God add his blessing to this word. Please be seated. As we've been going through this series, I've been opening up each, each week with a question for you. And um, this week, as we think about the shepherds and, and their actions and how we respond to Christmas, I was just wanting to hear from some of you, what, what is your favorite Christmas tradition? And why do you do it? Or why do you keep doing it? Maybe you don't know what the origins of it were, but why is it that you keep doing it? Uh, every year. So what, what are some of your favorite Christmas traditions? Suzanne? Uh, buying a Hallmark ornament for my son. Okay, buying a Hallmark ornament for your son. Why, why do you do that? Uh, so that when he puts up a tree, he'll have ornaments. Okay, so that, so that he has ornaments for his tree. Yeah. Yeah, we have a uh, fun tradition we took over from what Ginger's family had done, where every year we um, we get the kids an ornament that represents something from the year. And so at this point now, you know, Wilson has 13 ornaments that he can look back and see key events from, from each year of his life. And so those ornaments can be good, good reminders of that, yeah. Anyone else? What's your favorite Christmas tradition? Christmas ham. Christmas ham. Okay. Well, why do you keep having Christmas ham? My wife cooks Okay. Because because your wife keeps cooking it, and so you're glad to keep eating it. <laughs> that's that's a wise man. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah, Jean. I had a neighbor that uh, got me into doing when the kids were making a birthday. A birthday cake for Jesus, yeah. Yeah, just so the focus was on Jesus. Okay. His okay. I, I really like that. Now that there's no kids around, I'm not doing that. Uh, it served a purpose at the time. Yeah, keep keep the focus focus on why why we have Christmas. Yeah, yeah. Well, we have a lot of traditions around Christmas, but. Uh, these are all, a lot of these traditions are actions, things that we do. Last week we had looked at how we should react to Christmas, and that was with 
Anybody remember? Joy. joy. Yeah, we react to Christmas with joy. But we talked about how that joy is deeper than just a feeling of happiness. But even still, there's a difference, I think, between a reaction and a response. A reaction is something that happens when there is a, a stimulus, a, a, an experience. It's what we get when we mix two things together. My dad was a high school chemistry teacher, so I got to see a lot about different reactions as he would uh, share different things with us of what happens if you uh, put sulfuric acid on sugar and start to see the this column of carbon starting to come out of the beaker, uh, or even just simply mixing vinegar and baking soda and seeing it all foam up there. If you mix the circumstances of your life together with the content of your character, we get a reaction. Somebody cuts you off in traffic, and you react. Unlike chemicals, we're not static. We can be intentional about shaping our reactions by developing our character. But really, each individual reaction is only planned so much. Um, I had a friend in college who decided that any time somebody cut him off in traffic, instead of certain other things that he could do, he would give them two thumbs down. Just make a face at them and two thumbs down. It was great fun for him until he almost ran off the road. Uh, so he decided to stop doing that one. But a response is a little different. It's a chosen action, something we make a decision to do. We have an experience or we get certain news and we decide to do something based on it. Sometimes I think we just react to Christmas each year. But what we see in the story of the shepherds is that Christmas demands more than just a reaction. They experience joy, but then they did something about it. In the four weeks of Advent, as we lit the candle at the beginning of the service, this week is traditionally about love as the theme for this week. And Jesus described our appropriate response to life in a two-sided command, two sides to the same coin, in Matthew 22, verses 36 to 40. And I completely neglected to write it down on my paper here, so I'm going to have to read it off of the screen. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. Love God. Love our neighbor. And I'd argue that even though the word love doesn't appear in those verses about the shepherds, that it's actually present in their response to Christmas. We see the shepherds responding to Christmas with love because they follow Jesus together. They encourage one another and others around them. They tell what God had done. They love God, and they love their neighbor. And we are called to follow their example today. So as we start with this, following Jesus together is loving God. The shepherds followed what God told them to do. And Jesus would say later in John chapter 14, If you love me, keep my commands. But this isn't just a legalism of here are the rules, follow them, and everything will be good. We see with the shepherds, I think it's important, that acceptance precedes obedience. God sent the angels to them, told them he had sent a Savior, told them he had given them a sign, invited them in. And what have the shepherds done up to this point? Nothing. They're just up out on those fields doing what shepherds do, watching over those sheep. It wasn't a glamorous job. 
wasn't a job that was known as being one where the people were particularly pious. He didn't ask those shepherds to get their lives together first. If he'd wanted that, if he wanted us to get our lives together before he would come to meet us, instead of sending the angels, he might have sent this guy. I am very glad that our kids never got into Elf on a Shelf. Uh, it just seems like having to move that guy around every week gets, would be a huge hassle and I don't know, maybe it's just my generation, but thinking about dolls coming to life at night usually sounds more like the plot of a horror movie. Um, but, you know, we could do Elf on a Shelf, but we also, of course, have some others. Maybe you've seen some of these. Instead of Elf on a Shelf, we could have a Cat on a Mat, yeah. Or Fred on a Bed. Or... Shrek on a deck. Shrek on a deck. <laughs> and they said it could not be done, but an orange on a door hinge. <laughs> orange on a door hinge. Okay, okay. God didn't send the elf on the shelf to check up on whether we were being good boys and girls and whether we were going to get coal in our stocking or not. Acceptance preceded obedience. He came to us. He invited us in. But acceptance does precede obedience. Obedience should follow if we have welcomed him in. He did send a savior. The shepherds needed to be saved, just like us. Not so much from Rome, which may have been what they would have ex expected, but from their sins. Does someone have uh, Matthew 1, verses 20 to 21? You guys lead it. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save the people from their sins. Thank you. We need a Savior. He accepts us as we are. That doesn't mean he approves of everything we do. But we don't just need to modify our behavior. We don't just need to try to pull our lives together. We, we need forgiveness. We need a new heart. But then if we have received that, if we know that forgiveness that came through that baby in the manger, Notice he leaves it up to the shepherds to obey. He doesn't compel them. The angels just tell them, there's a sign for you. There's a baby wrapped in cloths lying in a manger. They had to choose whether they were going to take that step of following to live that out in their lives. I think it's also important for us to notice that they followed him, followed after Jesus, together. Christianity isn't a solitary thing. It's not just me and Jesus. We're made to be in relationship with God together. Jesus rarely instructed his disciples individually. It was usually as a group. And the shepherds didn't just send a representative they didn't just send one guy to go and see what had happened and then report back. We can't subcontract our relationship with God. I think sometimes we have a tendency to try to do that today, and we have pastors as ministry doers or elders within the church are the ones who are doing ministry, but everybody else is a ministry receiver. 
But we see that there's a, actually a very different model that God gives for us. And we have Ephesians chapter 4. Paul gives us a picture of this. Is that, Suzanne, were you the one who had that? Yes. Ephesians chapter 4, verses Here. 11 through 13. Wait, it, As he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of stature, to the fullness of Christ. Thank you. Those who are in leadership within, within the church, our role is to equip the saints for the work of ministry. That work is really to be done by everybody. We're equipped in different ways, with different gifts, but we all are to apply that in the different ways that God has equipped us. A lot of people talk about the 80-20 rule in any organization, especially in churches. 80% of the work is done by 20% of the people. That's not the way that it, it was designed to be. Actually, one of the things that encouraged me so much by our participation a couple of weeks ago at, at Illyria's Festival of Lights as we were handing out cocoa, you know, we typically will have, right, right at this point, about two dozen people here on a Sunday morning, and we had about 20 people involved in helping with the, the hot cocoa distribution there. And that, to me, was so encouraging, more so than the cocoa that we distributed and even more than passing out the postcards about the church. It was seeing people engaged in what we're doing and willing to serve as God leads. Each of us is responsible for growing in our faith, responding as he calls, but we also have the responsibility of helping one another to do so. One other thing about the shepherds as they're following, they followed what God told them to do, they followed him together, I think it's also important for us to notice that we don't know for sure, but it seems likely that they didn't bring all of their sheep into Bethlehem with them. They left those sheep out there on the hillside and went back to them later. But as we follow, as we show our love for God by stepping out in obedience, God might call us to set some things aside as well. Jesus talked about this in Matthew chapter 10. And somebody has that verse, uh, ver those verses. Matthew 10, 29 and 30? Or not? Oh, oh Mark 10. I was, I was reading a K as a T when I abbreviated it. Here we go. Here we go. Thanks, uh, truly, I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me, the gospel will fail to receive. Let me phrase that again. That needs a comma. <laughs> or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, mothers, sisters, brothers, children and fields, along with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. Thank you, Jean. Good day. God often calls us to set things aside or give things up or lay things down as we follow him. For some of us, we see at the beginning of the service kind of rotating through, there are some slides about some of the missionaries that our church supports. They've set, set aside jobs and family here in the States to go and serve him in another place. He might call us to give up hobbies or habits or relationships that distract us from following him. He may call us to give of the different resources that he has provided for it, to us, our time, the skills that he's given to us, that's yes, our money. Some of that may be permanent, 
Some of that may be just for a season. I doubt the shepherds left those sheep out on the hills for the rest of their lives. They went, they went back out and returned to their jobs. But God often calls us to set some things aside as we follow. He also calls us, as we love our neighbor, to encourage one another. The, sh the shepherds shared what they had been told with Mary and Joseph and the others who might have been around them. And we're told this was especially meaningful to Mary. She treasured these things and pondered them in her heart, probably for years to come. In the same way, we have a responsibility to share what has been given to us. Christmas is traditionally a time for charity, giving to help others. Uh, we have a tradition at, at Friends Church of having a Christmas Eve offering set aside for particular causes. This year it's for uh, the Moran Academy Christian School in Malawi and scholar, providing scholarships for students to be able to attend that school there uh, and also for our local uh, benevolence fund, the Care to Share Fund, to help people who are going through times of difficulty. We are called to share what we have been given. And it starts within the church as we encourage one another, but also goes outward. Galatians chapter 6, Paul gives us just a very quick summary of this. Dave. Galatians 6.10 Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Thank you. We are called, as we reflect on that, the gifts that God has given to us, and especially that most significant gift of Christmas, to do good for those around us, to everyone, but especially within the church. We should encourage one another in Christ. We remind one another of God's faithfulness and, and his promises to us. First Thessalonians, Paul speaks to a grieving church as they've lost many of those within their midst as, as they have died. And Paul encourages them with reflections about what our hope is in Christ and our expectation of joining him again. And he closes that whole section with encourage one another with these words. We are called to encourage one another, to remind one another of the hope that we have in Christ and strengthen one another in the fight that we have within this life. There are a lot of different translations of the Bible and, and some paraphrases too. And Ted and I were talking before the service and, uh, about how some of those paraphrases, if they, if they get it, they've got it. And sometimes the paraphrase can be a little bit off. But one of those uh, is the voice translation. And I particularly liked the way that they uh, had these verses from Isaiah. So Ted, if you would read those to us. Isaiah 35, 3 through 4. So, with confidence and hope in this message, strengthen those with feeble hands. Shore up the weak need and weary. Tell those who worry, the anxious and the fearful, take strength, have courage. There's nothing to fear. Look here, your God. Right here is your God. The balance is shifting. God will right all wrongs. None other than God will give you success. He is coming to make you safe. Thank you. We are called to encourage one another, to strengthen the feeble hands and those with weak knees, that we may encourage one another. So we follow Jesus together. We encourage one another. And then finally, I think what we see with the shepherds, of course, is that they tell what God has done. The shepherds spread the word about Jesus. And we're called to do the same thing. Just before Jesus left his disciples, he called on them to be his witnesses, to make disciples of all nations. 
And so this Christmas, who is God calling you to share with? As we do so, I think we can take some direction from the way that the shepherds responded. They glorified and praised God, not themselves. They were just the messengers. It wasn't about who they were, but they were glorifying and praising God. They were praising Him for the things they had heard and seen. We should reflect and we should share what our experience has been of God. How did we come to put our trust in Him? How is God at work in your life? How have you seen Him providing for you? How is He helping you through a time of difficulty? This Christmas, how is your family prioritizing Him over Santa and presents, all of the good things that Christmas has? How are you focusing on what is most important? They glorified and praised God for all they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. We can share with people how our experience of God matches what we've read about Him, what we know of Him through His Word. We can share how He has proven the truth of His Word to us in the ways that He has done so. And we should look for opportunities. This is one of those times of year when it seems the Holy Spirit tends to start working in people's hearts. As we reflect on this season and the ups and downs that it brings and we look back to the reason that we have this holiday at all, it can often lead to questions or conversations that lead to deeper topics. We aren't called to be obnoxious about it and just shoehorn it in when it's not part of the flow of the conversation, but we're also not called to be overly timid either. And that, I'll admit, is where I often tend toward, of missing some of those opportunities that God has put before me. So this Christmas, as we think about how we should respond, let's respond by following Jesus together and showing our love for God. Let's show our love for our neighbor by encouraging one another as we continue this walk of faith. And let's spread the word, loving those who don't know him yet, glorifying and praising God for all that we've heard and all that we've seen so that others may hear and see as well, that they might come to know him and see that it's all just as they have been told.